Kevin McCarthy, who is the House Majority Leader. Um, let me give you a little background of uh, his career. Kevin is from uh, Bakersfield, family of, uh, fire, father was a fireman, three, uh, two siblings, and he grew up, uh, went to high school in Bakersfield, and then won a lottery, mm -hmm. and took the money to build a delicatessen, and then used some of that money to ultimately pay for his college. He went to Bakersfield, California State University in Bakersfield, got a bachelor's degree and an MBA, and uh, got a job ultimately as an intern for Bill Thomas, who was a member of Congress from Bakersfield, did that for a while, but then he got elected to the California State Assembly and served there for four years as a leader in the State Assembly. And then when Bill Thomas retired, he was elected in 2006 to be a member of the House of Representatives. And then in 2011, he became the House Majority uh, Whip, and then the House, in 2014, the House Majority Leader. And um, now is uh, obviously one of the people responsible for the House of Representatives. So first I wanted to ask you, how could somebody whose last name is McCarthy open a delicatessen? I thought you had to <laughs> have a Jewish name or something. How did you do that? Well, I went, I, I was 19 years old and um, I was flipping cars at the beginning. Bakersfield's not far from here. And I, I met a guy that owned a liquor store but had a car dealer's license, talked to him to take me down here to the auctions and I'd buy and sell cars and flip them. And then I was visiting some buddies at San Diego State and I stopped at the grocery store to cash a check and the lottery started the day before so I bought a ticket and I won. You won $5,000. Put yourself in my place. I think this is 1985. You're 18 years old. It's Friday night. You just found 5,000 bucks and you're 10 minutes away from Tijuana. Um, mm. I invested in the market, did okay. And I, at the end of the next semester, I left school. I went to buy a franchise and no one would sell me a franchise. And so based upon the resources that I had, I figured a deli, it was like Subway before Subway. Okay. But there's three lessons you learn as a small business owner. Which is? First to work, last to leave, and last to be paid. Okay. And when you're delicatessen, be careful your fingers, you don't chop them off or anything, <laughs> right? That's right. I cut a few of them. Okay. So um, let's talk about your career before we get into some other issues. So um, you went to work as an uh, intern for Bill Thomas. Uh, was that a hard job to get? Yeah, because he turned me down. I mean, that's what kind of got me started. I, I applied for an internship. He turned me down, but it's one of those nice turn down letters. And if there's one attribute I have, I'm persistent. So I went back to him and said, I don't need to be paid. I didn't, don't need to go to DC. That's what the internship was right. for. Um, I just want to meet people in business while I was going to school. And I, I cut papers for free. That's what I started doing. Okay. So um, what propelled you to run for the House Assembly? And how hard was that to get started? Um, well, no one thought I would win for the House Assembly because the vice mayor was running. Um, your parents think you were going to win, or? Uh, no, most people who met me didn't think I'd win. Uh, I just outworked everybody. I, I was on the community college board, and we just, we had one of the biggest surpluses, and they cut the community college, and I just find community college much different uh, ability to change from an economic point of view. And so I ran, and everybody in Sacramento endorsed against me except two people, and I won, and in nine months I got elected leader, unanimous. Wow. Okay, so you could have risen up to be the speaker, presumably, if you'd stayed or something like that. So I'm a Republican. I didn't think, I didn't we think so. Good. Okay. I, we, we tried to win the majority. It didn't work. All right, so uh, Bill Thomas retired. Mm -hmm. He had been the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. You ran, and was it hard to get elected to the United States uh, House of Representatives? Um, harder to get elected to the Assembly than those who ran. There was a state senator who was running at the beginning, but uh, he backed out. It, it wasn't easy, and the... I ran in a bad climate, 2006, and if you look at my class that came in, we were the smallest Republican class in the history of Congress since 1914. There was only 13 of us, and no one defeated a Democrat that year. So uh, when you mentioned that, uh, roughly 95 to 98 percent of House members who run for re-election win, right? So they must be pretty popular in their district, but Congress has an overall reputation or popularity of about 13 percent. So why is Congress so unpopular, but each member seems to be popular with his or her own constituents. Well, if you take Congress, though, in today's world, that, that's true about those numbers, but if you look from 06 and today, it's had probably some of the biggest turnover it's ever had. I mean, two-thirds of my conference has been there seven years or less. 
I mean, you had the Democrats take the majority, then the Republicans take the majority. It's been a bigger turnover than we had in the past. Everything you're seeing in business about disruption, disruption is happening in politics. But one of the reasons that happens as well, a lot of people run and get elected by running against and making government negative instead of making government efficient and effective. Okay. And um, I think that has propelled part of the negative attitude. Um, some of it is very warranted by productivity, but it's almost universal. If you're Republican or Democrat, you're running against the, um, the system itself. So uh, let me ask you about uh, what it's like to be House Majority Leader. You've served under two speakers. Yes. Who, who was smarter of those two? <laughs> Look, everyone has their own different attributes. Um, and when I came in, I'll say a lot about uh, our current speaker, Paul Ryan. Um, I've met a lot of people that have been president, that desired to run. Uh, there's only a few people I've ever met that I think should be president one day. I think Paul's one of those individuals. Paul and I uh, partnered along with Eric Cantor and created Young Guns that um, started this about finding young conservatives that helped us win the majority. Um, each one has different... Sometimes people focus on policy. Sometimes people focus on structure. Um, Paul is a true policy person and a, such a decent man, and he believes everybody else is the same way. I mean, he would really sit down and have the discussion about policy, and I, I think he's doing a great job. The tough part of being speaker, you've got to have all the okay. attributes. Okay, so right now, roughly 75 members of Congress in the House live in their offices. Mm -hmm. And you're one of them. Yes. So um, aside from the fact that it's supposedly against the law to do so, um, why are so many members living in their house? I mean, is it because we don't pay members enough, or what's the reason? Yeah, you do it for many different reasons. I didn't start out living in my office, and I thought it would be a terrible thing to do. I rented an apartment. Um, I'm from California, and I come back every single weekend. I don't want anything that ties me to Washington. And the difficulty is you'd start working out, I mean, you start working all day, and then committees, everything else going through. And I have ca California, so I have a time difference. Then I'd go back to my office after whatever night events you were doing, and I found myself falling asleep on the couch. I also want to be able to work out a part of it. And so no time during the day. That time is usually always taken. So I would start going to gym early in the morning. And it's camaraderie. Uh, down there. It's very bipartisan. I have my workout partner is Joe Kennedy in Tulsi, and uh, I have a, a different group there, but very bipartisan. And I do it because I think I'm more productive. And uh, the minute I'm done with votes, I leave DC so, and I come back home. So, like in the morning, at seven in the morning, you see a whole bunch of members trooping in their pajamas or their sweatsuits oh. into the gym. <laughs> that doesn't, how do they? No, you come into the gym, however people are dressed. I mean, I, I have this former member who used to be a cage fighter. He had six professional cage fighters named Mark Wayne Mullen, and he leads this workout. I, I used to do P90X. Uh, Paul and I always did it, and um, I don't know if you know Tony Horton, who does P90X. So he would come and lead the workout about once uh, every quarter, and they asked him on the outside one time, oh, what does Paul Ryan look like? You know, and, oh, he, he's, he's, he's low body fat. And they asked about this other member who was young, who was on the cover of Men's Health with his shirt off. Oh, he's chiseled. Then they asked Tony, what does Kevin look like? And he says, he looks good in a suit. So um, oh, well, that was in the Wall Street Journal. So well, I, I changed up my workout. I John Boehner like, used to smoke a lot, it was said. And the, yeah, I guess he wasn't in the gym in the mornings, right? No, he wasn't in the gym in the mornings. So, the, the gym's not an elaborate place. It's like an old Elks Club, the members just go. But it's Republican, Democrats. There's no lobbying. There's nothing else going on there. And you get some bipartisanship. Okay, so let's talk about some legislation. Um, it is generally thought that the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership legislation, which both the House and the Senate would have to approve yes. um, by majority vote, yes. um, that it will not be brought up before the lame duck, but it is generally thought in Washington that in the lame duck it might be brought up and might even pass. What is your view on that? Well, I think the TPP has a couple different issues. And uh, they know what the issues are. We've worked w very closely with the trade representative. And they've got to work those out. There's not the votes for it right now. Um, I can't pre predict what happens in lame duck or if there is, even is a lame duck. Um, I'm one who believes in trade. Um, having 
TPA, Trade Promotion Authority. Um, one thing you have to think about, we had not had that for what, roughly the last seven years, and there was 100 trade agreements, and America was a part of zero. And when we really look at the TPP, that's as much about trade as it is about foreign policy. And uh, if we don't get that right, I will guarantee you China will engage and create their own PAC, and it will be to their levels and to their benefit if America doesn't lead in this world. And so um, I think we should always do it on its merit. I don't think, I never like the idea that someone says, oh, I'm going to do it inside a lame duck trying to game the system. Let's be really out front and open, and let's have the debate about whether it's positive or not. Now, the president is sending troops, uh, additional troops, uh, supposedly non-combat troops, to Iraq. And we have troops in Afghanistan, and we have other uh, forces in, Af in Iraq. But the Congress seems unwilling to actually pass a resolution authorizing these troops to be sent there. Why is it that Congress won't actually pass a resolution, and the president isn't actually pushing Congress to do it? But don't you think the president would be better served, the country better served, if Congress said you're authorized to have these troops being sent over? Well, right now, the president does have the authority. He has the authorization to use military. And um, the president proposed um, about a year and a half ago. He proposed a um, reform to it. And in proposing the reform, he actually tied um, his hands even further of what we could and could not do, and the world was getting more dangerous. So we had a discussion with the administration. We actually did one inside my office with a, a number of members on all sides of the aisle. No one liked where the president was going. It was going to make the country less safe in that perspective. So right now, the, the president has the authority. So there's not an argument of whether he does or doesn't. But I think we should be able to um, readdress that. And, but I'm not one for tying our hands even further in, in, the, in the time that the world is getting more right. dangerous. So President... Uh Obama has never actually proposed comprehensive tax reform during his presidency, and therefore, obviously, it's not going to happen. Uh, Paul Ryan and his predecessor, Dave Camp, um, seem to be saying maybe they would be in favor of comprehensive tax reform, or at least personal tax reform, or, or maybe corporate. Do you think in the next Congress, Congress is likely to propel forward uh, comprehensive tax reform, or unlikely? No, yes, and you can't wait till next Congress to do it. You have to do it now. I don't know if people are watching of what we're doing in Congress, and this is one of, the, one of the elements of what Paul has brought, trying to change the mindset of Congress to be the place of ideas. So we put together these task forces, and they're made up, and they, they go in different phases, and we're in like about the third phase right now. Um, made up of all the members. Anybody can come and give input. I uh, put together a number of chairmen of it. They're the chair, chairmen and women of the committees. One is uh, economics, so it's tax reform. You can't just talk about it. You've got to produce what, what do you think tax reform will be. We will have this um, come forward before the end of uh, the middle of July, before you go in the convention. We will deal with health care. Instead of just saying we're going to repeal Obamacare, what would we replace it with? Uh, the war on poverty, we've had, what, five decades of that. Hasn't been successful. You've got 94 million Americans out of the workforce in the process. So what do we look through? Article 1, you've had these powers that have been given away from the House and Senate and put into um, the executive branch. We need to rein those back in from a regulatory world as well. Um, foreign policy, national security, what should that look like to America? So what we're saying is we're going to produce these pieces of legislation, put it before the American public, and regardless of what you think is happening in the presidential race, we want this race to be about policy and ideas because this is the window in an election where America gets to make a decision. i rather that's what we decide who the next president is than instead of personalities. And remember, when, when Ronald Reagan became president, he had tax reform. But it wasn't his idea, it was Jack Kemp's. So a couple things are happening here. It's transforming the House to be the place of ideas. It's making these ideas public. So it's putting it into the arena of debate so America can see it and make that decision. So if the question is, can we pass it next year? The answer is yes, but you have to get it into the arena now so people can debate what they want to have go forward. So um, it is generally thought in Washington, D.C. that the Republicans have a lock on the House of Representatives. But some people say that Donald Trump is the head of the ticket. It might endanger the House's ability to be controlled by the Republicans. What is your view on 
whether Trump will help or hurt the House majority for the Republicans? First, I, I trust the people. This is a system that I believe works. Let the debate be out there. I don't, I don't see the House losing the majority in any shape or form. In presidential years, the House, uh, there is advantage on the Democratic side. I mean, we're at 246 right now. We'll be at 247 after June 7th. That's the largest Republican majority since Babe Ruth played baseball, right? It's not easy to maintain that, but I think we're easily going to maintain the majority. Right. Uh, I can go through so, so many different scenarios, and I could turn that question on its head and say, if I look at the Democratic side, Hillary Clinton is in the lead. She ran in 08. And do you realize in 08 she had 280,000 more votes, even though she was losing to Barack Obama at this time than she does today? There's an intensity level out there. And anyone that's going to tell you what's going to happen politically in the future, they're lying to you because this is different than we've ever walked through and nobody can predict where we are because no one predicted we'd be right where we are today. All right. In June, there are the California primaries coming up. Yes. Have you endorsed anybody on the Republican side for president? No. no I haven't endorsed anyone. And it's different in California. You know, we have the top two in an open primary, but it's not an open primary when it comes to the presidential. And... If you're from California, we have never really been in play in my lifetime for a presidential. And it is also by congressional district. Now, when Indiana will already happen, and Indiana will be one of the last states that's winner take all. And if Indiana turns out the way the polls say today, that means Donald, if Donald Trump wins it, the, the last polling says he's ahead. And I don't know if um, he or Cruz, I'm not sure which one wins that. But. It would, it would hinge now on California because mathematically somebody could get to 1237 if they won Indiana, and then you would play by congressional district, but you win as many delegates in my district as you win in Nancy Pelosi's district, and there's fewer people to communicate to. So whoever has a good structure and can compete in different areas, and issues are different. If you're in the Central Valley, you should be campaigning on water. You could do quite right. well. So um, you know Ted Cruz, I assume mm -hmm. somewhat, and you know Donald Trump. And yes. He, okay. So um, you could support either of them as the head of the I, ticket. I, will, I can support either one as okay. the nominee. And why are so many members of the House of Representatives, or really the Senate, unwilling to support Cruz, who's a member of the Congress? Why do they seem to not like him? You have That's any? a great question for your next panel, because those are two okay. senators. All right. I'll look. <laughs> Well, Joe Biden said at a uh, gridiron dinner that the reason people have an instant dislike to Ted Cruz is because it saves time. And uh, was, quote, was quoting him. Now, let's remember this. We're, we're, we're in the element of politics and towards the end. We're, we're going to, in any world, who's ever the last two people there, you're going to be criticizing. And, and you're competing on ideas. That's why I think that's the wrong approach. Are we really want to elect somebody based upon personality is we want to elect somebody based upon policy. That's why what we're doing in the House is so important on these task forces. I want the American public to start having a debate what they want the America to look like for the next 50 years. And if you don't have economic growth, we're continuing to lose businesses outside. And it's, it's the structure of our tax policy that is creating that. And then you have one side that says, well, I'm just going to tell you, you can't do it. Well, that's not the way that we're going to be able to compete properly. So in California, uh, in the general election, uh, California is generally considered, considered now to be a fairly safe state for the Democrats. Do you think there's any chance the Republican nominee, if it's Trump or Cruz, could actually beat Hillary if she's the Democratic nominee in the general election in California? It's difficult. Um, if you look at the makeup of California itself, we have 53 congressional members, only 15 Republicans. You look at the statewide ticket, uh, we don't have any Republicans in there. So if you look at modern history, it's pretty tough. The last time a Republican won was the first round of uh, George Bush 41. Uh, he won it the first time since then. Once Clinton won, we haven't been able to turn it back around. If we proportionated the race, I think it would be better for California. You know, Nebraska does this by congressional district. We're electing our delegates that way. I think with California being so large, 12% of the nation's population, it would be a fairer approach to portionate out by congressional district the electoral college. I think that would be better for the rest of the nation. Oh, and, and as you point out, Nebraska has done that. It's not against the Constitution, of course, to do that. No, that, 
Uh, really there's the another state, state that does it too. Is it Maine or who? I forget. Who Maine is considering as well. Yeah, they uh, have two. But California, it would make it more competitive. And all of you from California, we always have this debate. Should we cut California up into different states? Because it's so large. There are different issues in different areas. I believe as a nation, that would be a better approach for president. And you'd Thank have you. more about ideas. So um, recently, President Obama appeared over the weekend at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. People saw it. He had a lot of good jokes. He's obviously very good at that. He seems like a friendly guy. How come Speaker Boehner and presumably you had a hard time getting him to agree with you on certain things? Was it a good relationship? And why did it seem to not produce a lot of grand bargains? Well, I, the president has a very hard time making a final decision. Now, if you look at those things that have been successful in Congress, I don't know if anybody's in the medical field. We have this issue called sustainable growth rate, SGR. And for 14 years, no Congress was able to solve it. It always kicked it down the road. He, Democrats were in the majority. House was in the majority. We actually solved it last uh, year and a half ago. And we, actually, we got entitlement reform at the same time. You know the element of why? We left the White House out of it. I have a belief that I think people should be governor before they're president. Because when you're a governor, it's a better training ground. You can't print more money, but you have to balance the budget. You have to select a cabinet. At the end of the day, you have to make a decision on the bill. You have agencies you didn't create, but you have to run and make them efficient, right? Um, the president had never really managed anything. You don't manage your office as a senator. You got a chief of staff. Um, when we would have these discussions and we'd go to a lot of certain places, I've been in the room many times. I was in the room this one time. We were talking, and as Republicans, we were in this place. We said, we want to have some entitlement reform, and we will not ask for anything that's not in your budget. Anything that you propose, Mr. President, will only deal with that. And he said he couldn't do it. That's a real challenge. And so many times before, when we would get to that final point where we'd have a negotiation, and you've got to remember, no one side's going to get everything that they want. The Washington, D.C. is our nation's capital based upon a compromise, dealing with Hamilton and our fiscal policy of where we're going to go, our banking system. Washington was part of that. So I realized that going in. But at the end of the day, you've You've got to be able to get to that point. And every time we got to that final point, I kind of felt I was Charlie Brown and he was Lucy with the football. Well, uh, let's suppose for a moment that uh, Hillary Clinton is elected president. Just suppose for a moment. Do you think she would be easier to deal with for the Republican leadership in the House than Barack Obama has been or not? I'm not sure. Um, I've watched her in this primary go so far to the left. I watched her take positions that she had in the past that were principled positions and change them for a political decision. So I can't tell you where right. she would be at all. Um, look, we created this country with three co-equal branches. Today, they're not co-equal. The best thing we could do is bring them back to an equal process. And I think that will be safer for everybody else, but it would, be, it would produce a better product at the end of the day. So if somebody wants to influence you on a position, is it better that they come from Bakersfield or your congressional district, or they be a Washington lobbyist, they be a contributor to your campaign, they be a famous person? What influences you or other members of Congress the most? They ought to know their issue, and they ought to be very bright from the perspective. And they ought to tell me the pluses and the minuses. If you come in and you want to you give a position and you want to be one-sided, I assume you're going to give me your side. Um, I will tell you, being a member of Congress, the one place I take from... Now, anyone that had me as a teacher never thought I could be a member of Congress, right? I, I understand that. And Congress, we know about this much about everything, but we got to be able to gather. Um, I go to what I know best, and that's going to be back in the policies and philosophies and principles of what I think government should be more limited and smaller. Um, but I... There's no easy place. Just because the title of a bill is a nice title doesn't mean that bill does that. So I want to know the pluses and minuses and how it affects the world, and I'm going to make the best decision based upon my principles. And I don't think, look, I think a role of a member of Congress, they should lay their principles out to their district, but they should have to go back and explain why. If I'm going to, if 
my district expects me to know the time of all the different bills of what's going on and spend it that way, I should go back and explain it to them. And it may be at the very beginning the district thinks that's the wrong position. I should stake out and have to explain it why. So Cong member of Congress gets paid, an average member of Congress gets paid about $175,000, $179,000. That doesn't seem like a lot to have two houses and support a family. Well, to you it doesn't. And to my district it is a great deal. Okay. But some members are not un upset with their salary and therefore they, um, you don't think they'll be... Uh, higher compensation anytime soon. They're just not going to vote for have a salary increase. I, I don't hear from members. Uh, look, people go to Congress for a lot of different reasons. I didn't go to Congress for a salary. I went to Congress to change America. And um, I've watched a lot of people sacrifice. And we're the microcosm of society. Now, the Senate is more like a country club and the House is like having breakfast at a truck stop, okay? Um, <laughs> and on average... People are there about 10 years or less. If you look, a lot of them came in 2010 or departing. And some of them made sacrifices and made more before or not. But really, the majority of individuals believe in this country. They may have different philosophical beliefs, but they don't go there simply with the idea of what they're going to make. They go there on what they can actually, the outcome of what it can be. So what is the greatest thrill of being a member of Congress, and what's the greatest downside to being a member of Congress? Look, uh, I, I, downside is what some people say about you, but um, if you don't have thick skin, don't go into it. If you, if you don't want to make a tough decision, don't be a part of it. Right. Um, but every day I get to walk into that Capitol amazes me. That you get to walk onto that floor of the debates that we've had before. From the movement of civil rights to the day that I live in infamy, from the idea. Um, you can be transform transformational and make changes. Um, and you don't do it overnight. You've got to have tenacity that you're going to stay with something and you can change somebody's opinion. Um, but on a whole other side about not just what you vote on, you know how many opportunities you have with such a big bureaucracy to knock a wall down and change somebody's life? I'll leave you with this one. There's this Vietnam vet that was homeless that lived in my district. He'd been shot down three times in a helicopter, never had a home. He got the approval, and when he went to get the key, the VA held it up. But because I was a member of Congress, because I was able to call, we were able to put him in that house. So we go over and we give him this housewarming president. And you know what my best president I brought? I brought about six other Vietnam vets in. And he's in the back. He's showing it to me. And the pride of what he's having, he's looking out, and he sees what he calls his brothers. And you know what he finally said? I'm finally home. That when I came home and people spit on me, now I see that it's different. Now, that wasn't something I voted right. on, but I was able to be a voice for somebody that couldn't be heard from a bureaucracy. Mr. Leader, thank you very much for a very interesting conversation. Appreciate thank you. your service. <laughs> well, well done. Yes, sir. Okay, we now have two senators, one from the Republican side and one from the Democratic side. Mark Warner from Virginia. Bob Corker from uh, Tennessee. Please sit down. Okay, so just a brief introduction. Uh, to my immediate left is Mark Warner. Mark Warner is a graduate of George Washington University where he was valedictorian in his class and a perfect 4-0 average. It's hard to do. Um, and um, graduate of Harvard Law School, um, had the good sense not to practice law, and uh, got involved in the telecommunications industry and became uh, a very successful entrepreneur, and then ultimately was elected the head of the Virginia Democratic Party, and then later became governor of Virginia, and now a senator in serving his second term as senator from Virginia. Uh, Bob Corker is a graduate of the University of Tennessee, um, he is uh, somebody who got into business relatively early, built some businesses, ultimately sold them, became elected, was elected uh, mayor of Chattanooga, served four years in that position, then was elected to the United States Senate, and is now serving his second term, and is the chairman of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Okay? So um, right now, it seems as if uh, in the Senate, the Democrats and Republicans don't talk to each other that much, and it is often said that the Democratic leader and the Republican leader don't even talk to each other at all, uh, or hardly at all. So how can you have 100 people and they're trying to make policy, but you don't have leaders actually talking to each other? Is it as bad as we often 
read about, or is it not that bad? I don't think it's uh, it's nothing like that, actually. Oh, I mean, Mark okay. and I talk all the time. I I can always call Harry Reid on Saturday mornings on the cell phone and talk with him about whatever I wish, and I do it often. And uh, so I think the portrayal that people don't talk with each other is totally out of bounds and ridiculous. Right. Um, it's not like that at all. Uh, the fact is that we've actually been very productive uh, this year and have passed numbers of bills. Our Foreign Relations Committee is operating at, at, at an all-time high, candidly, since I've been there. And Mark and I have worked on some very, very complex pieces of legislation together. Uh, housing finance reform is one of the most complex issues, I think, that I've ever worked on, and yet we worked for a year and a half together to reach consensus. So I think that view of the way things are right. is really off base. Okay. I'm not as fully optimistic as Bob is on this. <laughs> he and I have actually worked together. I think we both get incoming sometimes from our you know, ex various wings of our party because we are more collaborative. I do think there is the portrayal that um, you know, people don't talk at all is way overstated, though. I, I remember yeah. another senator and I, uh, we would host dinners, 10 Ds, 10 Rs, at a time just to get to know each other. Because if you actually get to know each other, talk about your kids, it's harder the next day to get on the floor of the Senate and call each other names. But I will say that I think there are times when the quote unquote leadership of both parties actually doesn't encourage that kind of collaboration. Because if they can sometimes blame every issue on the other side and both sides do it, uh, they actually control more of the right. you know, flow of power and flow of what's happening. So I do think more uh, interaction between the senators, Bob is very good at. I try to do the same, um, but there is—it's not this kind of wall of silence that sometimes okay. the media portrays. So both of you have been uh, executives, chief executives. You were ran a, a mayor of Chattanooga, and you were governor. Um, what's the uh, frustration of being in the legislative branch compared to being the chief executive? And have you found that frustration so great that you sometimes say you wish you had your old job back? Yes. Okay. Well, you know, it's. Um, yeah, a couple of things. You know, people ask, what's the difference between being a governor or an executive and a legislator? You know, for the most part, a legislator thinks that the job is finished when the bill is passed. When I think a good chief executive realizes that's just the beginning. Passing the bill doesn't, it's important, but how it's implemented, how it's operated, how you review the program, get into the kind of mechanics of what works and doesn't work is really where the rubber hits the road. And I think there is a disconnect. I heard Kevin's comments earlier. You know, a lot of times, most members of Congress have not run anything. And there is a different um, difference coming from an executive. I mean, for me, there have been challenging moments. I got, it was fairly well known. I was fairly frustrated. I think there were times Bob were, and he and I would go back and forth about who was more frustrated at times. Uh, it's been one of the biggest challenges is, yeah. I remember when I was governor, Virginia, you get only one term as governor, but the cool thing is you get your title is His Excellency, the Governor of the Commonwealth, where everybody has to stand up when you come into the room. So I went from being His Excellency, the Governor of the Commonwealth, to a slightly junior member in a slightly dysfunctional organization. So it was a little bit of a transition, but not enough that you know, I signed up again, got rehired, and uh, I echo some of the stuff Kevin said. You know, there are frustrations, but you can actually get a lot done. Yeah, there's no question. I'm, I've been in the Senate nine years and four months. Um, running for a second term was a significant decision for me. And I had to ask myself, um, was it worth a grown man's time to serve in the United States Senate at that time? Now, today, I'm chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. Um, a lot of things that are not talked about uh, because we focus on ISIS or Iran, uh, Iraq, Syria, uh, China, Russia, Europe. Um, a lot of things I'm able to do, David, that, uh, look, you want to have impact in the world. Most of us who run for public office do so to have impact on the world. Uh, so in this position, even though I'm not an executive, um, I passed a bill that is going to help ensure that 50 million Africans have electricity over the next four years, that they, in fact, have clean water. Uh, I'm leading the charge right now to make sure that the United States leads the effort worldwide to end modern slavery, where 27 million people today are enslaved. Um, I reauthorized PEPFAR to make sure we focused on 
treatment, and we continued to end this plague on the world. So, look, I'm not an executive. Uh, there's not much talk about what I just mentioned, but look, uh, the people in this room are here because they want to have impact on the world. And so to live with the frustrations that I have not being executive is worth being in a position to impact people all over the world in the way that we do. So it's a pretty good trade-off. So, um, Mark, you did run for president once. and um, I kicked the tires. Kicked the tires, okay. Um, but, you know, you could kick the tires again. And, and Senator, you know, you've been thought very highly of in your party, and maybe you could run for president. Either of you have any interest in running for president again or considering running? My feeling is, unfortunately, the politics in our country at this point, I think, are more driven by the loudest voices on both ends of the extreme. And one of the frustrations, and I'd say I think you know, Bob has done a heck of a lot, but he speaks now as the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, where the Senate still is a hierarchical, seniority-based organization. And uh, I think a lot of that still comes, and Bob has done an excellent, excellent job on the Foreign Relations Committee. I think having power that comes with the committee chair is where you get more satisfaction. Also, you sometimes see in both parties, again, in the Senate, the loudest voices controlling, I think, the agenda on the extremes. I'm not sure in the kind of current political environment, someone, and I'll speak, I don't want to speak for both of us, that has more centrist views, that actually believes the other side might have, patiently have a good idea as well, uh, candidly is um, going to get nominated. Do you ever consider running for... You know, the, look, all of us who do what we do, um, are, we have people who mention to us who, from back home, around the country, some places, around, sometimes around the world, that encourage you to run for president. And so, you know, when somebody mentions that, you have to think about it. I did not think, um, personally, that this year was the year uh, for someone like myself uh, to do that. I, you know, first of all, I have this tremendous privilege that the people of Tennessee have given me to serve as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. No way to do that and run. Um, in the future, uh, possibly, I think Mark and I both would have to say, possibly, based on conversations that we both had. At the same time, um, to do so means that you pretty much have to wake up every single day with your sole desire being president of the right. United States. I'm just not in that place today. I feel like right. I'm making a difference, and, um, and I, I feel like it's such a privilege to do what right. I do. Senator, you have a very, very good reputation, excellent reputation in Washington. You're very, very smart. Obviously, I think people you probably realize underestimated the level of your intelligence when you, you got there. I don't know if you recognize that, but... You're saying because be, he's from East Tennessee? Yeah, yeah he didn't I'd mention say, I was valedictorian of you no, but, or anything like that. I got you're, it. So. You're, <laughs> all right. But you're, you're, you're very, very, very smart and highly, highly respected in Washington. Everybody <laughs> recognizes that. So can you, with a straight face, tell us why there shouldn't be a Senate vote now on the Supreme Court a nominee that President sent up? Very difficult for me to do that. Okay, sorry. So, so but let me, let me just mention, um, I was in Munich uh, the night that the Supreme Court Justice passed away at a security conference. And, you know, the email went out um, uh, from our leader. Um, I'm not on the judicial Judiciary Committee. Um, I've never had desire, any desire to be on the Judiciary Committee. The hearings are not occurring. I, I will say... <laughs> that it's been since 1932 that uh, a Supreme Court nominee passed away in the last year and was confirmed by the United States Senate, 1932. It's been since 1888 that it's happened under divided Congress, where you, or divided government. We had a president of one party and Congress of the other. What I've watched between Joe Biden's comments on the floor in 1988 Senator Reid's comments and Senator Schumer's comments, while this isn't the best of the, you know, of the United States, I'm not speaking of them personally, but this issue, the fact is that where you stand on this issue is based on where you sit. It's been sort of the held policy on both sides of the aisle that things are right, so, there. So, Mark, would you say um, that uh, it's realistic to think that in the lame duck session that this um, judge could be confirmed, or you think it's unrealistic given the Republican position? I, have, I don't have the slightest idea. I, I've been really disappointed, and, I, and I, 
I think the earlier comments in terms of what Biden said or Reid said or Schumer said, it was different times. It wasn't somebody that passed away this early in the year. I can cite similar statistics. Um, but the, the underlying argument uh, that you know, the president shouldn't exercise his constitutional power in the last year of his or her term just makes fundamentally no sense. And I hoped if I'd been in the Senate when those Democratic senators uh, had said that, I would have stepped up against it. I mean, under that same reasoning, nobody who's up for re-election this year as a senator should vote in their last year either on anything. So I, I just worry that this kind of tit-for-tat, back-and-forth that breeds more and more dissatisfaction. And again, this is great. Yeah, I, I would, and just, I would. let me just finish the one point here. I just worry that that leads to the kind of general public, to heck with all of you, the system is so broken that creates some of the candidates that we've, we've now got this year. And that scares the hell out of me. If I, if I could yes. add, I do have concerns about what this leads to down the road, I'll, I'll be honest. Okay, so let's talk about something that also is thought to be likely to pass or possibly pass in the lame duck, which is the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Do either of you think that that has a chance of passing the Senate uh, in the lame duck or in the regular session of Congress, or do you think it's more or less dead? I hope we pass it. I, um, frankly, I know the strategic thinking is to think after the election. I'm not sure, considering who it appears to be the leading candidates on both parties are going to be, that that necessarily makes sense. Are the problems with TPP? Absolutely. It's not a perfect agreement. It's, you had you know, more than a dozen plus countries negotiating that. Would I rather have us set the framework for trade for 40% of the world's population than China? To me, this is a no-brainer. I do think as advocates, though, as a, an advocate of global expansion of trade, both parties, Democrats in particular, who uh, sometimes have not been very good about saying to those parts of America that have lost from trade, you know, we've kind of said, chin up, don't worry about it. Well, you know, I can take you to wide swaths of Virginia, southern Virginia, south side Virginia, which were tobacco, textiles, and furniture. And there are huge numbers of losers from trade. And as an advocate of expanded trade around the world, most of the benefits have occurred to more metropolitan areas. Rural areas have been left behind. And as an ongoing advocate of trade, uh, I think we've got to do a better job on helping those areas left behind. My hope would be we'd vote before the election, after the election, in lame duck, you know, there's an awful lot of things being punted to lame duck this year. Um, I, would, I would hope we would get it done either before or after. So, the, you know, my staff and I are going this next week through the entire title. Um, it's very important strategically to our nation. I thought Kevin did a good job outlining uh, the merits of having an agreement. Mm -hmm. There are some issues. I mean, the database collections that the financial institutions have, that's a real right. issue, and you know that right. well. Uh, there are some other issues relative to uh, the pharmacy area, the pharma area, where, you know, intellectual properties are not protected as long as people would like. My Better than what we've got now is the base, though. Yeah, well, I'm on the same page you're on. So I think there are some things that, side agreement wise, need to be worked mm -hmm. out. It's been pretty surprising to watch in this presidential race, um, the, you know, where everybody's ended up being, if you will. The only people who have a chance of winning are expressing uh, opposition to the agreement at present. So that makes it difficult, uh, not for Mark and I, but it makes it difficult uh, if in, the, in the overall Congress, if you will, when you're president is elected and it's said they're against the agreement, it makes, makes it somewhat Senator, difficult. Senator, um, you know, if Donald Trump is the nominee, uh, and by the way, why are so few senators endorsing their colleague Ted Cruz? Is there any comment? I know you had a lot of fun with that the last panel. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, well, I'm I, sure uh, you can articulate better. By the way, I thought you did a great job interviewing Kevin. But, and, right, so uh, tell me, uh, well, I won't put you so on look, the spot with that let question. Me, let me say this. I, every time I go vote or leave a committee hearing, there's a large gaggle of reporters asking similar questions. I've been given this incredible pri privilege, David, of doing what I do. And I say that, by the way, with 1,000% sincerity. So every day, my job is to wake up and to have impact 
especially on foreign policy issues, but also on banking issues and others. For me to weigh in on this presidential race diminishes that ability. I've been very meticulous to not say a word, um, and I'm not going to. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, Tuesday, tomorrow, right. looks like uh, this. Okay, well, so let's just, suppose I'm not going to weigh in. Everybody says they don't want to be vice president, but very few people actually turn it down. So if Donald Trump said, I need somebody who actually knows Washington, knows foreign policy, been an executive, and can help me win Tennessee, would you turn down the vice presidency? Uh, again, we have, Mark and I have. <laughs> We're going to both we have, punch. We have, we have no effect yeah. whatsoever on whether we are selected. Okay. Uh, and, this is and, not a club either yeah. one of us are. Right. Well, let, me, let, okay. me let me answer the question a different way. I think any person, I've heard lots of people say, well, if X is elected, could they actually attract talent? Think about it again. People who run for public office and go through what they go through, they do so to have impact. If someone thought there was a working relationship with someone and they felt like that giving four years towards an effort that would have greater positive impact on the country, regardless of what is being said on both sides of the aisle uh, regarding this campaign, my sense is people would sit down and weigh, is this a place, is this a place where I can have more right. impact or not? Okay. Regardless of who the nominee is. The so-called great mentioner in Washington is always mentioning you as a possible vice president under uh, Hillary Clinton. Would you consider taking that position? I'm in a list of 15 at this point and growing. It's not something I've applied for. It's not something I'm looking at. And quite honestly, uh, it goes to some of the other broader questions. I've been pro-trade. I believe that we've got to get our the single biggest disappointment I've had in the Senate was kind of leading the effort around Simpson Bowles and not having that successful, but that also made me acknowledge that the math doesn't work around our entitlement programs. I think we need to maintain Medicare and Social Security, but we've got to make some changes. I've been in support of additional revenues and not just for the top 1%, on, but for a broader brace group of people. Um, I think I've got a series of positions that I'm not sure line up not sure where they line up with any of the, the candidates who are running. Well, but uh, Virginia, some people would say, would be the, a key state. And presumably, if you were on the ticket, you might help with those 13 electoral votes. So I think they could overlook some of your positions. But anyway, <laughs> leave that aside. Um, so um, in, in, um, uh, right now, I'll uh, ask you about the, the general election uh, or in the yeah. Senate. Um, it, the Senate uh, is Republican, but there are a lot of open seats, uh, maybe more than we've had historically had. And the Republicans are defending about 23 seats, I think it is. Is that right? Something like that. So do you think it's likely the Republicans will control the Senate after the election? I think in, uh, in this year's case, I do think it's going to make a, whoever's at the top of the, t whoever wins the presidency really will help determine that. If you look at where the Republicans are vulnerable, where we're vulnerable, they're in states that are swing states. And so um, regardless of how good a job a senator has done in a particular area, a big gap uh, the president winning overwhelmingly on the other side of the aisle could, could make a big difference. Now, let me just flip back in two years, though. In two years, should that happen, it could well reverse itself out because of right. where the seats are. So it's not like a long-lasting kind of thing. What's uh, the difference between being a chairman and being a ranking member? It's been night and day? or is You know, uh, on the Foreign Policy Committee, we, we have such a bipartisan... Uh, effort. I mean, the, the committee really is assuming the role that it's had throughout decades uh, over the last several years. And I work very closely with Ben Cardin. I did with uh, Chairman Menendez. Obviously, it's always better to be able to set the agenda versus okay. not set the agenda. And I think actually, but, but, Bob's but, 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 but we do it together. I don't know what's going on here. All right, he's going to give you another mic. But, um, you know, I, I do think on foreign relations, that has more bipartisan. I'm on intel. That's my more bipartisan. It breaks on committees. I, you know, I hope the Democrats win in 2016. I think that would be, uh, I'm a Democrat. I, I believe that would move the country forward, particularly if Hillary won. It would give us a, more ability to actually put some points on the board. Um, I do know, uh, echoing what Bob said, who kind of runs the board as the presidency. In 2014, I was supposed to be a blowout winner. Right. I won by about 1%. Uh, uh, I was 
I was surprised at that on election night. Uh, people it, hurt, were saying, it hurt his feelings. It hurt my feelings. But, you know, <laughs> but it, also, it also reflected the fact, that, unfortunately, that I think that our elections are becoming more and more like parliamentary elections. You know, I thought I'd built up this enormous political capital in Virginia, and the number of people said, oh, Mark, I you know, really like you, but I want to send a message to Obama, right. you know, uh, surprised the heck out of me. So uh, I do think, though, that the presumptions as Democrats that we have that uh, particularly uh, uh, Donald Trump were just going to roll over. Uh, I think the political class, Democrat and Republican alike, have been totally surprised by this phenomena. Because right. I think people in both, um, people, Americans broadly, are pretty darn frustrated. And right. one of the challenges we all have here, whether we are in public office, most of us in the room, we both had business backgrounds, we both can still can claim that we've been in business longer than we've been in politics. But I would hope, many in the room are leaders in finance, that we all get a little higher sense of urgency, that the level of frustration is, at, to my mind, at an all-time high. I would almost, I would even argue that, Bob and I have spent a lot of time working on a project he's heard about that, you know, I believe very much in the free enterprise system, but modern American capitalism, as it's currently structured with its focus on short-termism, is not working for a broad swath of Americans. The whole nature of work is changing from right. traditional 40-hour work week to more contingent work. There's no social insurance and no social contract in a 20th century legal labor framework around the future of work. And we need your ideas on this. I know this is not the time to make a pitch, David, but just the point is that regardless of who's elected president, who controls the Senate, um, I know you guys want to throw a shoe at the TV when politics comes on. We feel the same way sometimes when we're inside the TV, but if you tune out, all you do is turn the keys over to the extremes. And if you're all sitting here at Milken, we've all done pretty well. And we're gonna need you all engaged with, regardless of who the next president is, uh, to put some points on the board for the uh, country. Senator Corker, you did something that many people in Washington didn't think could get done. The Iranian agreement was uh, agreed to by the president. He thought once he agreed to it, that was it. You got him to have to take it in front of Congress. How did you pull that off? And and how was your relationship with the White House when you did that? Well, um, Congress had put in place the sanctions that brought Iran to the table. Whenever you put sanctions in place in order to give a president flexibility, you give him something called a national security waiver. The reason we were able to get people to support the effort was no one ever envisioned the president would use a national security waiver and waive it for eight years go straight to the UN Security Council and enter into what was called a non-binding political agreement that in essence was an international agreement agreed to without Congress's input. So the fact that no one ever anticipated a president would do that uh, gave us the, the wind at our back, if you will, to, for the first time, by the way, take back power from a president on a foreign policy issue, first time since I've been there nine years and three months. And, and interestingly, even some of the president's most ardent supporters, uh, his colleague in Virginia, Tim Kaine, who is very, very close to the administration, when I gave the reasoned argument that, look, the, the president should have to ask our approval um, in advance, if he's going to come back to us in eight years right. after it's all over with, Surely it'd be better if that happened now. Uh, Tim coming along after Menendez was with us really gave us tremendous momentum, and we passed it unanimously on the and, board. And let me just add that Bob and I ended up on different places on the agreement, but that legislation about bringing it back to the Congress would not have passed without Bob Corker because all of us, you know, regardless of where you were in the agreement, trusted that he would run a straight process. And you know, we celebrate what's wrong in Congress, but uh, he did the country, and I think uh, into the world, in the whole world, regardless of where he ended up on the agreement. So did you get a lot of and I think uh, people, by the way, really took the vote yeah. seriously? It was a great debate. I think the nation and the world understands the agreement much better today than they otherwise would have. And I think Congress's oversight, which was also part right. of this, will continue to be. So important. did you get invited to a lot of state dinners after that, or not that many? So I have a. Um, I didn't get invited to any before right, right, or after, right, just okay, for the record. Right. <laughs> Look, it was, a, it was not the best time uh, for our relationship, but I'm just going to say this. I, I don't think people understand.
understand the interaction that takes place. I actually have very warm feelings and relationship towards the president. And I talk with Dennis McDonough nonstop. If I called him today on the cell phone, he'd be back to me in an hour, his chief of staff. Um, so, you know, I think they know, David, that I don't, there's not a morning that I've woken up since he's been right. president that I woke up thinking, boy, I'm gonna get a piece of his hide today. And since they know that, um, we agree on things and we disagree on things, but we do so agreeably right. and it's based on principle, but then there's another topic that has to be addressed. Mark, you led a similar kind of complicated effort to have the gang of six to kind of get a overall, I'd say budget and finance agreement and that didn't quite work out, but you made a lot of progress. What was the frustration of trying to go against the, the leadership in that instance? You know, there was, that was the single most frustrating time I've had in this announcement. Two and a half plus years. I think if we'd gotten a vote on the floor of the Senate, we would have gotten 70 votes. And uh, I think it was because it was kind of a rump effort. Um, at the last minute, it kind of blossomed forward and we got both, when you got the Wall Street Journal and the, the Washington Post editorial board agreeing that this is the right process, you know you've done something. But at the end of the day, I think both political parties' establishments, in terms of the no tax crowd on the Republican side, and we can never touch entitlements, even if we're going to make sure they're there 30 years ago, refuse to kind of have those issues debated. And I think the country is in a, a more difficult spot. Debt and deficit's going to ratchet back up. We're going to session on this later. Um, single biggest disappointment. And, you know, and there was one thing that would, was this the group of Republicans we were working with, it was curious and at times, within the same 24-hour periods, we would, one of my Republican colleagues would say, Warner, you know, if we're gonna do this, you gotta make sure Obama's on board. We're not gonna negotiate it twice. And then in the same 24-hour, they'd say, my God, if Obama's for it, we're sunk in the house. So there was, you know, uh, and the president, I think, should have endorsed Simpson Bowles earlier. He did endorse the Gang of Six at the end of the day, but this issue is gonna come roaring back so a final question uh, for both of you. What is the greatest pleasure of the job you have now? And what would you say simply is the greatest frustration of it? Look, the, uh, uh, I know that McCarthy gave a great, told a story, a vignette of this Vietnam veteran. Uh, David, you just have no idea. Uh, the people uh, that we come in contact with and the effect that we as a senator are able to have on uh, right. on people, so that's the greatest uh, positive. And in, in many cases, it's individuals; in some cases, it's large groups. The frustration is that it's Congress, right? And it takes a long time to make things happen. Uh, we're functioning a little better today. We still have not addressed the biggest issue our nation faces, and that is the fiscal issue. Um, that is highly, highly frustrating. And the fact is, both parties. Uh, seem fearful of wishing to, to address that issue. So that is frustrating when I know that when this meeting ends, we start at 9.30, at 10.30 in just a minute, this nation is going to be weaker because of our inability to address the greatest threat we have to our nation's sovereignty and to our well-being, and that is the fiscal issue. I would simply add, um, one, it's been great to, you know, Bob Corker and I, would be friends regardless of whether we were in the Senate or not. We actually have so much more in common than candidly we have with some people in our each respective parties. And there's a lot more of this in the Senate than people, I think, appreciate. What I like, one of the things I like the best, I like the individual stories that we all have. But you know, there's nothing that is more intellectually challenging than the ability that basically your world is your oyster in terms of you know, being able to go at issues of big and small and trying to wrestle with them to get to where you think is right. That is, that is um, uh, the greatest benefit. I think the greatest challenge at, at times is, somebody described the Senate once as a high school you never graduate from. You know, and the fact that people sometimes bear grudges that go back 20, 30 years, and as a CEO from the tech world, and I think Bob has been more kind today than I've been maybe on this, the fact that the pace is so slow and there's, this sense that, well, if we don't get to it this year, we'll punt it till next year. And I don't feel in a world that's moving as fast as our world it is that we have that luxury.
Thank you both, Senators, for your service and for your interview. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you.